everyone, from wherever you're joining, thank you for being here today for this NCAR Explorer Series conversation, how weather and wildfires interact. Insights from aerosols in Sub-Saharan Africa with Dr. Rebecca Buchholz and Dr. Osinashi Ajoku. My name is Dr. Evie McCumber, and I am an educational designer for the NCAR Explorer Series. The National Center for Atmospheric Research, or NCAR, is a world-leading organization dedicated to understanding Earth system science, including our atmosphere, weather, climate, the sun, and the importance of all of these systems to our society. I am really glad to be with all y'all today. For this conversation, we will take questions throughout the event. So please submit any questions you might have using this Slido platform. If you scroll down this webpage, you can see this Slido window just below where you are seeing the live stream video of this event. If you haven't already, go ahead and click on the green join event button, and then you can ask questions on the Q&A tab and answer poll questions on the polls tab, both of which are found in that blue bar across the top. And definitely be sure to join Slido to add your thoughts to a word cloud question. What do you think of when you hear aerosols? Because we're going to get to that really soon. This conversation is also being recorded and will be available on the NCAR Explorer Series website. With us today, we have Howard University professor, Dr. Osinashi Ajoku and NCAR scientist, Dr. Rebecca Buckholz. Dr. Osinashi Ajoku completed his PhD at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography in sunny San Diego in June of 2020. Shortly after, he started a postdoctoral position under the Advanced Study Program at NCAR. Currently, he serves as an assistant professor with Howard University's Program in Atmospheric Science. His research revolves around better understanding aerosol cloud radiation interactions over Africa and the adjacent Atlantic Ocean using satellite observations and regional and or global climate models. Dr. Rebecca Buchholz completed her PhD at the Center for Atmospheric Chemistry at the University of Wollongong in Australia, studying Southern Hemisphere atmospheric compositions using a range of measurement and modeling techniques. In October of 2014, she started a postdoctoral position in the Moppet Group with an NCAR and joined the team as a project scientist in 2017. Her current research uses global climate chemistry modeling and remote sensing to answer questions about air quality and atmospheric composition, with a particular focus on the impact of wildfire emissions. Rebecca and OC, welcome. Can you turn your camera on and give a quick hello before we check out the work cloud? Hello, everyone. Uh, first and foremost, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you may be. And uh, yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm looking forward to this conversation. Hi, I'm Rebecca. I'm also looking forward to talking about weather and wildfires today. Okay, thank you so much for being here and so, or for saying hello. Um, now, before I turn this over to our speakers and we get into our science, let's check out your thoughts on our work cloud. Paul and Brett, would you share a slide for us, please? Let me see, what do we hear? <gasps> yeah, so what comes to mind when we hear aerosols and we have spray cans, bad news, hairspray, which is what I was thinking about, fog and smoke, particles in the air, soot, small particles, clouds. What do you guys think about these answers from our audience? I think uh, we have a very enlightened audience. And um, yeah, no, I'm very happy to see these responses. Very good to know that um, the audience is knowledgeable ahead of time of what we're going to be speaking about. Yeah, this is a really good range of responses for this question. Um, we have the hairspray and spray cans, as, as we all know and hear about aerosols every day, but we also have the definitions in there as well. This is great. I'm very proud of our audience. This is, this is great. Um, I really thought it was going to be all about hairspray because that's the first thing I have. But thank you so much for setting me straight that this is not the kind of aerosols we're talking about today. Um, OC, one of your areas of research interest is the transatlantic transfer of aerosols, and one of Rebecca's is conducting atmospheric measurements. Could you guys tell me how your different areas of research intersect? Yeah. Um, so when you think of 
when I think of fires, right, let me be more precise. When I think of fires and biomass burning in particular, it's not only just the release of aerosols into the atmosphere, but you're also releasing quite a bit of gases. And um, these gases are very responsible for air pollution. Some of these gases include carbon monoxide, nitrous oxides. And the reason to me why it's important to study some the effect of these gases is because they're precursors to ozone. And we know that ozone can have uh, tremendous impacts. And um, I think that's just one of the few different ways in, in which um, Rebecca and I um, research and inter intersects together. Yeah, I'll talk about um, one of the tools that I use to um, study atmospheric chemistry is observations from space. So if you bring up that first image, we can see this is really observations of fires from space. So each one of these little red dots is a, a location of a fire. It's not the size of the fire, it's just a location. So they're not huge fires, um, but we can see uh, this is a satellite image and it's, it's observations from NASA. And that green circle there is the region of the world we'll really be focusing on today, but we can see there are fires all around the globe. So fire is really a global phenomenon. This is August in 2018. And so this is an observation of where the fires are. And I also use observations of atmospheric chemistry components like Osi mentioned, carbon monoxide is a gas. So I use a lot of satellite measurements of that particular trace gas. And there are also measurements of aerosols, which we're talking a lot about today. And so that's kind of where OC and I overlap in terms of the aerosols and, and then the interaction with uh, weather in this particular region of the world. And, and just to add um, an extra fun fact for the audience, um, if you saw that slide, you saw that Southern Africa was circled in green. And um, a fun fact is just that Africa is the single largest continental emitter of biomass burning aerosols. Um, so when you're talking about aerosol emissions or biomass burning aerosol emissions on a global scale, um, Africa is the largest source. I did not know that. Um, thank you so much for letting me know that. And for our audience, please make sure that you are answering our slide of questions. Um, we have one coming up in which we're going to look at why would we study fire seasons? But Rebecca and Osi, with your roles and what you're doing right now, what was it that made you become interested in doing this type of work? So um, yeah, actually this work is near and dear to me. Um, so I'm actually Nigerian American. Um, I've been home plenty of times. And every time I went home, primarily during the winter season, you would always see smoke in the atmosphere. And, um, and it's very rare that you're actually able to see a clear sun or even the sun beaming hard on you. Uh, but nevertheless, it's still hot and there's plenty of air pollution laying around. You can see the smoke just in the horizon everywhere as far as the eye can see. So that's what's really started to pique my interest in this research. Yeah, Evie, and for me, I uh, am really interested in understanding how things work. And I also have this interest in mathematics and chemistry. So atmospheric chemistry is like the perfect combination of mathematics and chemistry for me. And in terms of specifically looking at fires, I'm actually asthmatic. And so I noticed when I moved to Boulder in the fire season, my asthma would be starting to get really bad. And so understanding why that might be the case and where it's coming from has is, is kind of got, got me interested in it. Well, you mentioned fires. So um, I want to bring up the slide of question as to why would scientists want to investigate fire seasons? Why would we care? And our answers are because of heat, preparation, because knowing the conditions leading fires, we can face this problem. Um, and we're learning so much about how paracumulus drives further storms and weather and global temperature increase so might fires and I am in Colorado and in Colorado we are very familiar with wildfires but OC that is not the same um what exactly does it mean to have a fire season and is our audience on the right track and what they're thinking um I would say more or less so they are correct um so when I think of the word season I think of a portion of the year that's marked by particular weather patterns. 
And so when you think of the fire season, it's pretty much falls into the same category. Every fire season is marked by particular weather patterns. Um, so when you think of a fire season, you usually think of um, warm, dry conditions, not a lot of precipitation. But most importantly for a fire season relative to a wildfire, you need to have a sufficient amount of a fuel source. And in this case, the fuel source is vegetation, um, particularly grassland and savanna types of uh, vegetation types. Um, and use, these usually act as a, the source for the burning. So that's what I think of when I think in terms of fire season. Um, and, it's, and it's pretty prolonged. And in this case, it might be on the order of a couple months. So to add on to that, when you, when you think of season, right, the word season as a climate scientist, it sparks the word predictability. So when you're able to understand what's actually causing the fire season, you're able to better understand how to predict it, you know, ahead of time. And that's pretty much the name of the game, being a climate scientist. So it's very important to understand how the vegetation burns. So by understanding how the vegetation burns, you're able to understand the intensity of the emissions, um, which leads into another bag of worms, um, right? And, and I can keep going on and on, but that's what I think of when I think of the term fire season. Okay. Where are these fire seasons the most common? Where do they happen most commonly? That's a good question. Um, so most commonly, these wildfire or fire seasons occur in the mid latitudes, uh, usually in dry climates. So when we think of our uh, Earth's convection cells, we think of the Hadley cell. Um, the Hadley cell is the region uh, between the tropics and the desert regions responsible for the convention of air. So usually in the descending parts of that region, in the mid latitude, say near the Sahara Desert, near the Gobi Desert, near Australia, you have these large high pressure systems. Um, and these uh, large high pressure systems are partially responsible for the dry conditions that are occurring, uh, particularly over the Saharan Desert and over the Gobi Desert. And um, when you have these dry conditions, you just have dry air um, being blown around. So this tends to evaporate some of the uh, water that's in the soil. It reduces the soil moisture. Um, and this essentially leads to the start of a fire season. Um, what information can we gather from fire seasons? Like what do they tell us about what is happening? And are there any models that help us understand what is going on with them? Um, another good question. So. When I think of fires, um, I tend to think of human behavior. Um, kind of a weird comparison, but just follow me. So most fires that are occurring throughout the planet, they're actually anthropogenic in origin. So most regions where these fires are happening, particularly places like Africa, they're driven by agricultural means. So you know, if you're living in a rural region, uh, particularly over Africa and, and places like um, Southeast Asia, your your agricultural needs are, they're, they're relying on the fact that you're clearing the, um, the grass from the prior season before, and that's a term known as slash and burning. So slash and burning is actually um, a large contributor of the fire season and the fire emissions that we see in most of the world. Um, and, and less so on the natural side would be lightning strikes. So that's what fire seasons usually tell me is, is it tells me a lot about human behavior. Um, before I ask you another question, let me see if our audience has any questions that are popping up through Slido. Let me see. Any questions from our audience? Let's see. Okay. Okay. Well, then I have a question. Um, as you are, have been researching this for a few few years, like let's say you're an, let's call you an expert on this, um, are we seeing any changes in fire seasons over time, like how they're developing, the size of them? Is there something different now? I would say one thing that we've noticed is. Um, is the onset and the length of the fire seasons. 
um, as we're evolving on the, on the changing you know, planet with climate change, we have to understand that nothing is set in stone as they used to be. So one thing that we're trying to understand is exactly the length of the fire season. And this is usually, this is usually changing depending on the location, wherever you're at. Um, so I know particularly over the Western US uh, where springs are happening earlier or the onset of spring is occurring earlier in the season. Um, and that can have an impact on the fire season. But from my perspective with the area that I look at, it's kind of hard to, to quantify these trends um, because you know these fires are so variable in nature. And um, I don't know, Rebecca, if you wanted to add on to that. Yeah, that's exactly, I agree with, with that totally. Definitely there are these regions in the world that are seeing longer fire seasons due to hotter dry conditions already, uh, but it's not the same everywhere, yeah. So if the fire seasons are not the same everywhere, what are the particles that are being emitted the same? Um, because when I think about fires and particles, I tend to think about ash and large materials. But Rebecca, those are not the only emissions from fires, correct? Like, could you tell me more about what kinds of materials are generated by the fires? Are they solid? What states of matter are they? Yeah, Evie, that's a really good question. Definitely there is ash being emitted from fires. We see it with our eyes. And that's not the whole story. There's more to the story than that. There are other particles and gases. It's actually a really complicated mixture of gases and particles that are emitted in the smoke and emitted from these fires. And we're looking at an image here that my colleague um, Kelly Basanti showed a couple of weeks ago. And I thought it was a really nice image showing all the different types of aerosols that you might see coming out of a fire. So we have these black carbon particles um, or aerosols, and those can absorb a lot of light. And that's why they're this sort of really dark black color. And then over on the left, it shows a little uh, browner color. That's the brown carbon particles. And then we also have down the bottom in the white, uh, lighter colors, organic carbon particles. So there's lots of different complex uh, particles that can be emitted, as well as these gases that we were talking about before. Carbon monoxide is one of those. There are other uh, carbon containing complex molecules that can turn into particles later. They're kind of sticky molecules that can coagulate together and become particles. So yeah, it's really complicated, Evie. <laughs> yeah. Um so you mentioned that we had brown carbon, black carbon, and particular particulate organic matter. Um, so let's see if that matches with what our audience said that particles were being emitted. Could you please bring up the slider question? The multiple choice. Oh, see, our audience knew it. And honestly, they were better at this than I am. I really was thinking that all the particles that we could see um, coming out were going to be very large and macroscopic. Um, but Rebecca, could you give me an idea of how big these particles are or how small these particles are? Uh, yeah, a lot of these aerosol particles are actually quite small. If we go to the next slide, um, we have this definition of PM 2.5, which means the particles are smaller than 2.5 microns. And so we can see this in relation to a human hair here. So this gray, uh, image in the middle, this gray line in the in image here is, is a human hair zoomed in. And the little blue dots are PM10. So they, those are particles that are 10 microns or smaller. And then within those blue particles are these little PM2.5 particles. So they're really, really tiny. If you look at your own hair and you could imagine these really tiny particles. And a lot of that smoke is made up of this PM2.5 particle size aerosol. And the reason we're really uh, concerned about these PM2.5 uh, aerosol particles is they do have health impacts. So when you breathe them in, they're really difficult to get out of your lungs and they can cause cardiovascular issues. So how do we measure the amount of particles that we have? Um, and what are considered accepted levels of particles emitted? Um, for air for those. 
Yeah, so uh, we tend to measure these particles. There's lots of different ways of measuring. The, the units are micrograms per meter cubed that we tend to use. So it's kind of like a, a weight of, of uh, these particles in the air. And um, in general, we want to have them pretty low. So we really want them to be kind of below 12 micrograms per meter cubed. Uh, that's really healthy air quality. And when we have smoke events, uh, like we see in the west coast of the US and you can see the smoke, that's unhealthy. That's really unhealthy levels. And that can get up to above, you know, 150 micrograms per meter cubed. You mentioned that they were getting into the Western area. Um, how are these particles being transported um, in those distances? Like, how are we getting them from all the way over there? Yeah, so because these particles are really small, it's 2.5 microns, they tend to stay in the air a little bit longer than those ash particles. So the ash can kind of fall out pretty quickly. But these tiny particles, um, and aerosols can be lofted into the atmosphere a bit higher and at the higher altitudes there are stronger winds that can transport them far distances. So for example in Colorado we can see impacts from the west coast fires that we have in Pacific Northwest and California. We got some pollution from those in the last few years here in Colorado and really bad air quality days due to the fires that were happening on the west coast. So these particles are being emitted from fires. Are they affecting our weather properties? Are they doing something to our weather? Yeah, there's a whole, uh, there's a whole bunch of interactions that aerosols can have with the climate and weather. So we saw those different aerosol particles, the different colors of them, the, the black carbon, the brown carbon. So they have different direct interaction with sunlight uh, you know they may absorb less or more of the sunlight and so that can change the regional uh, temperature and then there's also scattering properties so instead of absorbing sunlight it can just reflect it away and so reflecting away can also change the local temperature as well uh, and then there are other aspects where the aerosols can interact with water and, and determine clouds, how bright those clouds are, how many clouds there are, uh, and, um, and whether it might, whether those clouds might create rain or not. So that's kind of um, an overview of, of all these interactions that aerosols can have with weather. I'm not sure if OC wants to add anything else there that I might have missed. Um, yeah, no, you, you covered the gist of it. I can, I can talk a little more, but I think I might speak about that in a little bit. Um, I am being told that we have a question from Steven, so can you please bring this up? What is an aerosol? That is taking it back to the basics of this. So an aerosol is just a particulate matter suspended in the atmosphere. Um, that's a bare basic definition of an aerosol. And that's why it would include hairspray. Because when you spray out the bottle, you see it floating in air. At that moment, it's an aerosol, not when it's in the can. Yeah, I could just add to that as well. These little particles can be solid, they can be liquid, or they can be a mixture of both as well. OCs, most of your research has to do with biomass burning in sub-Saharan Africa. And I understand that you study a particular set of months for the monsoon season. But before we get into what your answer is, I want to know what our audience think, which during which months would scientists study monsoons in the Gulf of Guinea? So may we please bring up that slider question? Ooh, our audience is divided. Um, 
we are all over the place. So um, OC, could you please first start by saying when and why we study uh, months of season during those particular months, please? Yeah, so um, the answer to this question is actually the third option um, between the months of, of June through August. And um, I, I can actually elaborate on that portion a little bit. Um, it actually deals with the, the prior question that you asked me dealing with the progression of the fire season. So some over the continent of Africa, the progression of the fire season is really dependent on the location of what we call the ITCZ or the intertropical convergence zone. So by understanding that this ITCZ is bringing uh, towards a moisture uh, into the continent, this is responsible for the moisture associated with the monsoon. And earlier on, since we said that a fire season is usually occurring when there are dry conditions available, we know that over Africa, and particularly West Africa, the fire season is not occurring with the monsoon. But as an as a ITCZ, as it migrates further north in Southern Africa, you have these prolonged dry conditions, which are very, um, which are very, you know, needed for these fire seasons to start. So during the West African monsoon season, what we call the WAM, which is occurring through the months of June through August, you also have the onset of the fire season in Southern Africa, which is transporting aerosols over the transatlantic. That is really fascinating. Um, I could not fathom to understand like that idea of monsoon and fires both being correlated. Um, so OC, you have been researching the monsoon season, as you said, with regards to fire season and biomass burning. What was it that made you interested into that research and what are its origins? Yeah, um, so as a student, I was one of those really nerdy students. Um, I would just constantly watch satellite images, you know, the videos that are looped together, the hourly and the da uh, daily images. And my attention was always focused over Africa. And I would notice that, okay, these fires are happening like clockwork during these specific months in Southern Africa from June to October. And also notice that, okay, the ITCZ is shifting north and we also have large cumulonimbus, you know, clouds in West Africa, large scale convection. And I'd always see these smoke aerosols being transported with the monsoon. So one cool thing to mention about the monsoon is that it's caused by not only the migration of the ITCZ, but also what we call um, a large inner hemispheric temperature gradient. So going from the Gulf of Guinea towards the Sahara Desert, we have increasing temperatures. So when you reach the Sahara, we have very hot temperatures and this causes air to converge in that location. And this is what we call the monsoon flow, right? Which is also in the same location as a trade wind. So when these, when these fires are occurring, the smoke aerosols are being transported with this monsoon flow into the West African monsoon region. And that's what makes it a very interesting location to study. That's really, really, really interesting. Um, could you talk to me a little bit about how aerosols influence light attenuation and weather? Um, how does that affect having all that smoke? Yeah, um, I'm not sure if we can pull up slide six. Yes, so this is a, a picture of the light uh, attenuation. And I, and I know Rebecca touched on it earlier, but just to let everybody in the audience know, it's. It's a totally different beast when you're able to see this up front in person. When you're actually on the ground under under a layer of smoke and you're actually seeing the attenuation. So, like Rebecca mentioned, um, these aerosol have various radiative and microphysical properties, and most of these biomass burning aerosols have an absorbing nature. And when you're absorbing radiation aloft above you, um, you have less radiation reaching the ground. So just imagine if you're standing outside and you see a cloud pass by the sun, less radiation is reaching you. Now, in terms of the larger research that I'm interested in, this monsoon region is affected by this temperature gradient, which also has a radiation gradient. Um, so by influencing or reducing the amount of radiation over the Gulf of Guinea, you're actually influencing this temperature gradient as well. Um, so 
these aerosols have plenty of, of impacts, but that's, you know, just speaking a little bit about the radiated properties. So let me see if I understood this. Um, what you're saying is that these aerosols are affecting how cloudy or how bright it is on the Gulf of Guinea. Like, is that what you're saying? Yeah, correct. So um, another fun fact for everyone in the audience, every single cloud you see in the atmosphere are composed of aerosols. Um, there are no such thing as clouds without aerosols. I mean, it, it's possible, but it's it's very hard to achieve naturally. So understanding that we can understand or try to better understand the impacts that smoke aerosols have on cloud formations over this region. And this slide right here is um, an image of recent field campaigns that have been conducted over um, the Atlantic Ocean to understand these air, what we call aerosol cloud radiation interactions. Um, and just to name a couple of them, you see the Oracle's campaign, um, as well as the LASIK and Clarify campaign. So these are campaigns that are originated out of South Taomi in the Gulf of Guinea, as well as Ascension Island, uh, which is in the center of that red rectangle you see on the right-hand side. Um, so plenty of these uh, campaigns have been used to understand these aerosol cloud interactions. And in the area where you see the, the purple and the yellow right there, what we call Walvis Bay, um, adjacent to that, you have a large stratocumulus deck um, and stratocumulus clouds are very important for reflecting incoming radiation and maintaining that radiation budget um, over this region. So to better understand how these aerosols um, influence these cloud formations can help us understand um, how the radiation budget over this region as well. Awesome. Um, and I know you have touched upon this again, but I just want to make sure that I really understand this. Could you please talk to me a little bit more about that relationship between the monsoon season and wildfires? Again, just a little bit more. Yeah, so during the monsoon season um, and over the Gulf of Guinea, um, we have large cumulonimbus, large, large cumulonimbus clouds. We have large scale convection. Now, in order for this convection to maintain itself, the atmosphere has to be what we call unstable meaning that as you go higher in altitude in the atmosphere, temperatures start to cool down and get a little cooler. Now, if you introduce this smoke um, within the monsoon flow, and we understand that uh, the, the radiative properties of the smoke is, is in an absorbing nature to absorb radiation, this tends to heat up the location that this smoke is residing. And we can understand exactly how the smoke aerosols are influencing the stability of the atmosphere or the ability for the atmosphere to convect or lift air that's on the surface higher up into the atmosphere where the air um, you know, dissipates, condenses, creates a cloud and, and forms precipitation. So that's the direct connection between smoke and the monsoon. And that connection is really through the modification of the cloud structure um, within this region. I have also a clarifying question for myself. You mentioned radiation budget. What does that mean? What is a radiation budget? Yeah, so a radiation budget or a radiative balance is how the Earth basically um, keeps itself cool. So because the Earth is tilted on its axis, um, we have excess radiation at the, at the equator. And the Earth is trying to move this energy towards the polar regions. And it just happens that where this monsoon region is occurring is near the equator. And this energy is being, this excess energy that's accumulated in the equatorial regions is being transported towards the poles. Um, and that's happening usually at the surface. So by understanding how aerosols can influence the amount of radiation reaching the ground, we can try to better understand um, the possible impacts that these aerosols may have on the Earth's radiation budget. Yes, um, so um, we have a question from the audience. Um, may we please bring up Jeremy's question? That's not it. Um, 
It says, observing from space, are the effects of the biomass burning on light attenuation more important when the smoke is above, below, or within the clouds? Um, first and foremost, Jeremy, this is a, a very great question. I, I think what Jeremy's touching on is essentially what we call the aerosol semi-direct effect. So the direct effect, like Rebecca mentioned, is the direct interaction that aerosols have with radiation. But Sometimes the aerosols, not only do they absorb the radiation, but they can impact the vertical temperature profile, right? So to answer Jeremy's question, it really depends on the type of cloud and the location that you're looking at. So just to stay, just to uh, keep this in perspective with the region that we're talking about over the Southeast Atlantic, you have low level stratocumulus clouds. And these clouds are usually somewhere between 500 to 1,000 meters in altitude. Now, sometimes you can have smoke residing, let's say about 1,500 meters in altitude. So this would put the smoke above the clouds. Um, now, what that would do in some cases, according to research, and you know, Jeremy, you know, you can get in contact with me, I can reference you later. Um, this tends to thicken the clouds underneath, what we call cloud thickening. Um, so that's in the case where smoke resides above a cloud, if you have smoke residing within the cloud, this can lead to cloud burnoffs, and that can have the opposite effect, where instead of thickening the clouds, you can lead to cloud dissipation. Um, so yeah, and that was kind of a long answer, but it really just depends. Thank you. Um, we also have another question um, from Ariane. May we please bring it up? Ooh, this one is fascinating. Um, Modeling community is not totally agreed on how aerosols, particularly from fires, impact weather and climate prediction. What are your opinions on this? Um, yeah, no, I, I can go. So my opinion, um, models vary in nature, right? Um, and every model, is run with different dynamics. So that's why most models tend not to agree. Um, but I would say it's actually more important just to understand the fundamentals of what's going on in terms of the fires burning, how do these aerosols interact with the other components of the Earth's system. Um, so my, my understanding or my belief is to have models understand the questions that I can't answer using observations, right? So for example, with a satellite, we can only see straight down, right? From the top down, that's the top down profile. We can't really understand what's occurring. We, we can't understand what's occurring within the cloud structure. And that's what that's one of the many uses that a model can help us to understand. Um. Before we, we move on to our next topic, I just want to see what our audience is thinking about um, in our slide or poll, what effects could biomass burning have on our climate? Because I am very interested to see what they think about it. Whoa, changes in precipitation, yeah. Changes in clouds, more lightning, nutrient cycle changes. Um, Rebecca, what do you think about our audience's answers on this question? Yeah, these are great. Uh, these are great answers. It's it's basically all of all of them. <laughs> so yeah, um, there as we've been hearing today already, fire is really an integral part of the Earth system, and it has all of these potential impacts in terms of when it emits smoke and how that smoke might interact with the climate. And so yeah, changes in clouds might happen, as Osi was just mentioning, how it can. Uh, how it can dissipate the clouds depending on where those aerosols from the smoke are, are located above or within or uh, and, and what type of aerosols they are, whether they're those absorbing, strongly absorbing or uh, reflecting aerosols. Uh, and then, yeah, the changes in precipitation as well, as we were mentioning, depending on uh, the interaction with the clouds as well, and then the regional temperature changes. And this is all really important for the Gulf of Guinea and Sub-Saharan Africa area that Osi and I are interested in studying. 
And then there was that uh, point about more lightning as well. So we have uh, in really strong fire situations, really strong smoke plumes, we have intense energy being released and lots of aerosols. And we can actually have these pyrocumulonimbus clouds, which create their own weather and lightning. And um, that can also be impacted. And then in terms of lightning, it's um, aerosols seem to be needed in the earth system to create lightning. So when we have more aerosols from smoke, that, that impacts lightning as well. So yeah, there's definitely many reasons to think about biomass burning and how it can impact and influence and interact with the climate system and, and weather. So that is why scientists are very interested in biomass burning. But me as a person, um, why should I be involved in understanding the effects of biomass burning? How does it affect um, me right now? Yeah, I mean, we've seen some really intense fire seasons recently in the North America region. And so fires can have really direct impacts on people locally in terms of health and, and, and property and, and, and local impacts. And there's also these transported impacts in terms of health where the smoke is transported downwind. So as... Um, as someone who might live in places affected by this smoke, it's important to uh, think about how we might want to reduce these extreme fire events that are occurring. Yeah, I, I like knowing. Um, I always like knowing the science, but I also like knowing why besides the science. So it's always fascinating to me. Um, so I... I was wondering, um, because I hear a lot about El Nino, La Nina, and all of those things. Are any of those like climatological um, phenomena affected by biomass burning? Is there anything that they do? Yeah, it's really interesting because so the climate system is really interconnected. So we have the climate impacting fires. We have, you know, depending on the El Nino Southern Oscillation, which is a measure of climate variability based in the Pacific Ocean, um, that climate variability can impact fire variability depending on how it impacts different regions, whether it's drier or warmer. Um, it can influence where the fires occur. And what we're finding as well is some of these huge fire systems, like the ones we saw in Australia in 2019 and 2020, they can release so much smoke and pollution that they can actually feed back into the climate system and start to potentially alter these large climate variability signals that we're seeing. And so there's this, this really complicated back and forth between the climate impacting fires and the fires impacting climate. Um, and one of the things that is also happening that OC talked a little bit about um, is that we now have places that are burning that usually didn't burn. Um, could you talk to me and well, us a little bit more about why that is happening? Yeah, again, it's this kind of changing climate impact on different regions. So one of the particular locations is uh, the permafrost in, uh, in northern hemisphere areas. So we could bring up the um, slide nine, actually. There's a really good image on the left of slide nine that shows this kind of legacy carbon, this carbon that has been stored in the earth, which is usually covered in water and is really difficult to burn. As it dries out, this carbon that hasn't burned in a really long time starts to get burnt. And so this image on the left, this, this artist's impression of what's happening is fire is attack, attaching itself to this legacy carbon in the, in the permafrost that hasn't burned in a long time and releasing carbon dioxide and aerosols and emissions that um, were usually stored in the earth. Um, and then on the right here, we see one of these recent fire impacts uh, in uh, North America, how close it is to human populations. So. 
Oh, see, um, I'm going to bring this back to like our backyard um, in the U.S. Um, so could you please once again, just like try to explain to me fire seasons just to make sure that we have fire seasons very, very, very um, straight. So earlier on, I was saying um, a season is just a prolonged period with particular uh, peculiar weather patterns. And in this case, over the US, we can see that the fire season usually occurs in the middle of summer um, leading into the fall. Um, and you can see, looking at the, the legend, you can see how this is differentiated between US as a whole and the Western US. So over the Western US during the summertime, we are um, exposed to prolonged periods of dry conditions. Um, and to add on to what Rebecca was saying, particularly in like a La Nina year, where we have drier than normal conditions because we didn't get enough precipitation from the prior winter, this can actually exacerbate the fire season and um, increases intensity. Um, so that's essentially what we're seeing here. Um, the, the, we're seeing fire seasons by looking at one of its proxies, which are uh, carbon monoxide emissions. Um, and yeah, so that's what we understand. So over the US, we understand it's mainly happening in the West Coast. Um, there are uh, other areas that are also experiencing fires, particularly uh, areas that are covered with uh, low level forests, such as Northern Michigan. And we also have a pretty quantifiable amount of biomass burning occurring in the Southeastern US um, I believe that's the burning of old sugarcane, um, sugarcane crops. You know, that's also a form of slash and burning. Um, so yeah, it's the prime time to do it right before the next uh, planting season. Thank you so much. Um, we have a very interested audience. So we have lots of questions. So I hope you're ready. Okay, let's just get started here. Um, we have a question from Mike, which is how does climate change impact fires and how fires impact climate change? Yeah, I can uh, I, I can start off with that, Rebecca, if you don't mind. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna do something different. I'm gonna talk about this more from a, uh, a, uh, a social perspective, you know, from a human point of view, not just thinking of the earth as, you know, just a system by li living on its own, but, we, it's, it's, it's good to understand or try to thoroughly, you know, get to your head that we're partially at, or at least fully responsible for climate change, right? The anthropogenic impact on climate change is, is real, right? So by understanding that, climate change, industrialization, right, can help influence, you know, fires, you know, activities such as deforestation, Right can influence fires, and, and that's really where I'm getting at in terms of uh, of how we can actually impact. You know how climate change impacts fires, and how fires can, can impact climate change. So when you have more fires and more emissions, you have more uh, uh, issues with uh, air pollution as well. When you have more fires, you also have changes in temperatures, right, uh, regionally, and also could be in another part of the globe. Um, so. In Africa, where I'm looking at, I'm actually looking at how Southern Hemisphere biomass burning aerosols influence Northern Hemisphere precipitation. Um, so that's a good way, I think, that we can understand that. Thank you. Um, in our last 10 minutes, let's see how many more questions we can get to. Um, may you please bring up the questions? Um, ooh, from Catherine, it's, I think Rebecca mentioned this. What are the alternatives to slash and burning? I actually, I really can't think of any alternatives, right? Um, just once again, going to a human perspective, slash and burning has been a process that's been done for thousands of years, right? Definitely before we were around. So it's really hard to find an alternative I think it's more so um, finding cleaner ways to burn. Um, yeah, that's that's a really tough question. Uh, and, and that's something that researchers, I think, are still trying to study and quantify till today. 
Yeah, that is, that is a tough question. I was just going to add something that I, I have heard about people using uh, goats to manage uh, to manage landscapes in terms of reducing vegetation. So I'm not sure if that could potentially be a way to manage uh, manage crop residue, but but that's a way that there's actually management of wildland systems using goats to uh, keep down the weeds and, and the and the underbrush. We have a question from Mary Ann, which is, are there important aerosol differences between forest fires and grassland fires? Yeah, that's a really good question. I think, I'm, I'm not sure if Osi was just about to, to say something. And I think there are differences in the aerosols and emitted gases that you see from these different uh, landscapes or vegetation types. And that's definitely something we use in our models that we have different emission ratios for different gases and aerosols when we when we yeah, model the emissions that are coming out of these fires. Osi, did you want to add anything? Yeah, uh, you're definitely right. So depending, and you know, I'm definitely not um, a botanist, so I can't answer this with you know thorough certainty. But the um, the ratio of black carbon to brown carbon usually is different depending on what's being burned. Um, in addition, when you have forest fires, you also have an increased emission of isoprene and other vo uh, volatile organic compounds. Uh, maybe that's a, another something else that the audience can look up on their own. Uh, volatile organic compounds, VOCs, um, these are usually uh, emitted more in forest fires, I believe. Right. Ooh, from Jacqueline, how will modeling the transport of wildfires aerosols across regional to global scales be addressed in atmospheric chemistry models in the future? Um, yeah, I didn't want to do this, but I guess I guess I'll plug myself in a little bit. So to answer that question, which is another man, you, we're getting some heavy questions. Oh man, I'm kind of sweating here. But anyway, um, so I'm looking at how these uh, black carbon or brown carbon aerosols, uh, aerosols from biomass burning, I'm looking at how these aerosols impact something called a cloud transition um, over this region. So over the region that we're looking at in the Atlantic Ocean, we have the stratocumulus clouds that I mentioned, but we also have cumulus clouds. Um, and this just occurs because, you know, when you're going from subtropical waters into tropical waters, the, the sea surface temperatures start to increase and the clouds change, just to keep it simple. So I want to understand how those clouds change in the presence of biomass burning aerosols. And that's definitely something that we can answer using atmospheric chemistry models. Great. Um, I, let's see what we have here. Sorry. Um, let's look at Sam's questions, Sam, Samuel's questions. Um, his PhD research was on assessments of extreme climate change related hazards. From his research, um, he observed forest fires occurred on some highland forests. He tried to extract the historical dates of occurrences from fire data, but the spatial resolution was coarse. Are there any websites that are archiving forest fire data for researchers to work on? And can we have an NCAR research working group on extreme events? He's interested. Um, I can definitely answer the former question. Um, so you're definitely right, Sam, in the sense that um, a lot of these uh, measurements are, are pretty coarse. So it gets, a, it gets hard to quantify on a regional or even a larger scale exactly what's occurring. But one website that may be helpful, and, and I don't know if Rebecca, you're going to mention this website, is Aeronet. Um, so Aeronet, um, A-E-R-O-N-E-T, Aeronet. That is a site that's a, um, it's pretty much ran by NASA and, and various PIs affiliated with NASA. And Aeronet is a station of instrumentations that's located um, at different locations. So these instruments used uh, ground-based LIDAR to observe um, various meteorological variables, including uh, aerosol uh, concentrations or what we call aerosol optical depth. And from this, you're, you might be able to answer better questions. And I know that the Aeronet 
density is pretty good, um, particularly over the US, but also has um, a worldwide um, a worldwide existence. So you'll find these Aeronet sites uh, throughout the globe. Yeah, I would just add, uh, you could look at, I'm not sure at the time period, Samuel, that you're looking at, but there is the FIRS satellite instrument as well that has higher resolution measurements of fires. And you could also look at trace gases that might be coming from fires, like for example, formaldehyde is measured by uh, OMI and TROPOMI and comes from other sources as well, but that might be an indicator of, of fires if you look at different trace gases that are signatures from, from fires. And then an NCAR working group on extreme events. That sounds very interesting. We should, we should consider that. Right. Um, June, from Marianne, um, I have read that aerosols injected into the stratosphere can circle the globe in a matter of weeks. Have you heard that? Is that true? Yeah, that's true. Um, but Rebecca, did you want to add on more to that? I was just going to say the Australian fire, wildfire season 2019-2020 was a huge example of that. It got into the stratosphere, it circled really quickly, and then it stayed there for a really long time. Great. We have two more questions. Um, what are some of the chemical differences between brown carbon and black carbon from Finn? I can start off in this and maybe also you can add if you have anything to add. So the, the black carbon is really those uh, solid particles. It tends to be that kind of really fine, solid uh, ash-like particles that are, that are small. The, the brown carbon is more organic molecules that are sticky and, and more uh, liquid in nature. And so there are lots of different types of organic molecules that go into a brown carbon particle. Yeah, I'll more or less, yeah, I would agree. Excellent. Our last question from our audience. Um, cultural burns are used in many places of the world to sustainably manage fire-prone landscapes. Do either of you know if that has been done in Africa as well? Yeah, um, that, so good question. Uh, so KP, that's exactly what I meant earlier when I talked about um, agricultural practices. Um, and how, you know, fires really tell us a lot about human behavior. So um, the same thing is really occurring over Africa. Most of these fires that we see are, are, are a product of slash and burning, although, you know, a good portion of it is due to deforestation, um, which is for a different political means we can talk about another day. Um, so for any students who are listening today, what advice would the two of you give them if they're interested in becoming a scientist like the two of you? Yeah, I'll go first. Um, number one thing is to have confidence in yourself. Um, you know, you might hear like the typical go-to answers of you need to make sure your grades are great. You know, you need to have all of these skills. But the number one thing that I'll say, and I'll let Rebecca touch on some other things, is that you need to have confidence in yourself. Yeah, and I think adding to that, to gain that confidence is to really follow areas that you enjoy studying. So there are lots of different ways to get into science. And so you might be interested in data analysis and really understanding what the data is doing. Or you might be interested in statistics. There's a new field of machine learning and AI that can really have uh, really interesting applications in atmospheric chemistry and atmospheric science. Or you might really be interested in visualization. And so creating beautiful plots or beautiful maps like we saw today, that's something that is really important in science or communicating science as well. Like for example, journalism about science. There's many different ways to be involved in science. And so getting that confidence in the direction or the subject area that you really like and then bringing science into it, I think is a way to, to really gain that confidence. Thank you so much. And with that, Rebecca and OC, thank you so, so much for being here today to chat with us about wildfires and the really cool and amazing work you're doing 
also thank you so much to our team behind the scenes, Paul, Brett, Aliyah, and Dan for supporting this conversation. If you're interested in more NCAR Explorer Series events, definitely check out our website for upcoming lectures and conversations, as well as to see recordings of past events. So I hope to see y'all next time and have a great rest of your day. Thank you so much.